Welcome back to Bad Radio Art with me, Sam. And this time we're talking about the stuff that's hard to remember, the stuff that's just laws and rules that you have to know if you're going to be in ham radio. The legal stuff. The boring stuff. We're working with the feds. But we'll also get into how call signs work and international stuff, so let's get started. Radio waves ignore borders, go everywhere, and bandwidth is limited. So governments like to know and control what is happening on the air. In the United States, the group that manages the RF spectrum is the FCC. It's an acronym, and it stands for the Friendly Candy Company. No, wait, sorry. That's an old joke. It's the Federal Communications Commission. Notice that it says communication and not radio or something like that. The FCC is focused not only on the air, but they also manage the internet and other forms of communication. Interesting, that. So, they've got a book of rules. It's actually part of the U.S. Code, and the FCC rulebook is divided into parts. Ham radio is defined in Part 97. The FCC rules for amateur radio are in Title 47 of the CFR Part 97. You need to remember the Federal Communications Commission and Part 97. Probably. In the beginning of Part 97, the basis and purpose of amateur radio is defined, and they go pretty hard. Like so. The rules and regulations in this part are... No, wait, that's completely wrong. The rules and regulations in this part are designed to provide an amateur radio service having a fundamental purpose as expressed in the following principles. A. Recognition and enhancement of the value of the amateur service to the public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. B. Continuation and extension of the amateur's proven ability to contribute to the advancement of the radio art. C. Encouragement and improvement of the amateur service through rules which provide for advancing skills in both the communication and technical phases of the art. D. Expansion of the existing reservoir within the amateur radio service of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts. E. Continuation and extension of the amateur's unique ability to enhance international goodwill. Seriously, man. What Part 97 says is, wait, right? Part 97 wants people who know how radio works, the potential for emergency communications, international niceness, and I forgot to write non-commercial. That's pretty important. You can't make money off this. Anyway, let's talk what radio art means. The art of radio is pretty broad. It could mean building your own radio. It could mean painting with RF, as I'm showing here. It's also what we do at camp. The art of amateur radio is the science of the electromagnetic spectrum combined with the creative imagination of the amateur operator. It's good stuff, even with all the rules. All right, so let's talk about the thing we're all here for. Your license. Here, let me get mine out of my wallet. Ham licenses are a bit different from regular FCC licenses, and they want you to know that. A ham radio license is both a station license and an operator license. A station license is permission to put a radio in a place and have it operate. But your amateur radio license is also an operator license, which means you actually have permission to operate that radio that's in that place. And that's true if it's a base station at home or an HT that you're carrying around, like the one you're going to get when you pass your test. All right, so just to make it clear, an amateur radio license is actually two licenses in one, a station license and an operator license. The exam may ask you for that. So your license is good for 10 years. The one I've got here expires in 2032. You can renew it without taking another exam. If your license expires, you have a grace period of two years where you can still renew your license without an exam, but you won't be able to operate on the air until you do. It's also one license per person, with a very limited exception we'll talk about later. So, there are three classes of ham radio licenses. The technician licenses are the entry point, and this is the license you're studying for. General is the second tier, and comes with more privileges. Extra is top tier and has all the privileges a ham can have. As Becky put it, the technician is the noob, the general is the mid, and the extras are tryhards. No surprise that Becky's a mid and I'm a tryhard. You'll be the noob, but this is ham radio and not the internet. 
We love working with new people. We want more people in this hobby. <laughs> no, really. And of course, with any privileges, there are always responsibilities. Here they are. First, the SEC can show up and inspect your radio equipment at any time. Ham radio is a self-policing hobby, and the FCC trusts the ham radio community quite a bit to manage its own business. So you're more likely to get some help from the community than an FCC field agent, but they do reserve the right to inspect your equipment. They also need an email address to contact you at. We've fortunately already got this covered, so we're good. They also need an address for you. It can be your home address, but it, it can also be a P.O. box, as mine is. All right, that's enough for licenses. And now for some rules stuff that they may ask you about in the quiz that are kind of edge casey. As you know, radio propagation is pretty complex and takes in a lot of factors. One way to figure out what you can hear on the air and who you can talk to is a bacon station. A bacon is a fixed transmitter that transmits a constant known signal. If you can hear it, you can probably talk to that part of the world. If you can't, talking to that part of the world might be pretty hard. Bacon stations are limited to certain parts of the band, known as sub-bands. Wait, have I been saying bacon? I mean beacon. Beacon stations. Yikes. Now let's talk about a few hard-to-draw things. This is one that will almost certainly not apply to you, but it might be on the test, so here it is. One of the bands that a technician class operator has access to is 1.25 meters, also known as 220, as it is around 220 megahertz. When I was a kid, the 219 to 220 megahertz chunk was reallocated from the amateur radio service, in other words, primarily taken away from hams, and given to a package delivery service for local communications. While we don't have primary access to the 219 to 220 megahertz segment anymore, we can use that spectrum for fixed digital message passing. In other words, computers that don't move around and just pass messages back and forth can live between 219 and 220 megahertz. Again, I have no idea how to make this interesting, but it's one of those lawful things that they might ask you about. So here it is. More interesting is what happens at the very bottom of the six and two meter bands. The six meter band, again, 50 to 54 megahertz, and the two meter band, again, 144 to 148 megahertz, are important bands to hams, especially two meters. The bottom 100 kilohertz of each band is given over entirely to CW modulation, also known as Morse code. This part of the band on 2 meters is often used for EME transmissions, Earth, Moon, Earth, which is exactly what it sounds like, bouncing radio waves off the freaking moon. 144 to 144.1 megahertz is comfortably above the maximum usable frequency, so it'll go right through the atmosphere. Just to summarize, the bottom 100 kilohertz or 0.1 of a megahertz, of both the 6 and 2 meter bands are given over to CW modulation. Cool? Cool. Let's talk power. If you'll remember from our Ohm's Law and Stuff video, power is measured in watts. And you'll be unsurprised to learn that we have lawfully defined power limits in ham radio. For a technician operator, such as yourself if you pass the test, the rules are pretty straightforward. Below 30 megahertz, where technician privileges are pretty slim, you'll be limited to 200 watts. Above 30 megahertz, where tech privileges widen out, you've got access to 1500 watts, or 1 1.5 kilowatts if you know your SI units, which you should. As you might imagine, there are tons of ways to measure the power of waves, and here the FCC uses peak envelope power, or PEP, to keep things simple. There's a lot that goes into it, but basically it's measuring the peaks of your waves. I only label one side here, but it's the whole width of the wave that determines PEP. The point here is to limit your privileges on bands that are below the maximum usable frequency so they stay line of sight and theoretically local. That doesn't mean you won't be able to talk long distance with your tech privs. Heck, that Earth Moon Earth stuff goes a long way considering it bounces off the freaking moon. But the idea is to keep technicians on the HF bands pretty quiet. Okay, remember when I used the word primary a second ago? Let's talk about that. If a chunk of frequency is given to amateur radio on a primary basis, that means that it is four hams. If you're on a frequency and you're using good radio etiquette, you're good to go. That means you don't have to worry too much about somebody knocking you off the frequency you're using to communicate. Emphasis here is on good etiquette. However, on a secondary basis, that means that someone else has primary access to the spectrum and we're not allowed to bother them. 
If someone from that primary service is there, you can't interfere with them. If they start using a frequency you're on, you have to move. That's the basics of primary and secondary allocations. All right, now let's talk a hypothetical. We've got the two meter band here with that 100 kilohertz CW bit, but you've built a microwave that can send a message on the radio when it's done cooking, and you'd like to put it on the two meter band. Where do you put it? You ask the frequency coordinator. Frequency coordinators are volunteers. They're usually hams, they're regional, and they work together with other frequency coordinators and the ARRL. They are selected not by all hams, but by a group of stations that are eligible for coordination. Sorry, forgot how to spell eligible there. They break that whole stuff part from earlier up into a group of subbands, so you have some idea where to put various kinds of activities on the radio. Important ones are repeater outputs, inputs, simplex operations, and digital. In our hypothetical scenario, there's a kitchen appliance subband, and that's where you'd put your microwave. Also, couldn't spell appliances. Sorry. This is actually pretty close to the 2 meter allocation, but check with your local coordinator to make sure. Nearest to me, and to most of you, that would be the WWARA, or WARA, the Western Washington Amateur Relay Association. All right, let's get to talking. First, pretend that there's an Earth, and there's a country on it, with a ham that lives in it. That ham has the call SQ1DNK. In another country, the USA, a Becky is in it with the call KG7FZH. Not shown on this Earth is the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU. Think of it as the United Nations of radio, which is easy because it actually is part of the United Nations. As we now know, the USA has the FCC managing radio communications, so it stands to reason that the other nation will also have a radio management organization. If both countries have ham radio, and the FCC hasn't prohibited US amateurs from talking to that country, congratulations, you can talk to each other. It's actually pretty rare when the FCC prevents US hams from talking to another nation's hams. For example, it's 2023 and there's nothing preventing me from talking to stations from Russia, even though there's an economic embargo going on. In fact, I did have a digital contact with a Russian science platform in June. I'm not showing off here. This is something anyone with HF privileges can do fairly easily. To summarize, you can talk to anyone anywhere. In the rare instance a country doesn't have ham radio, that's a big nope. In the rare instance the FCC says you can't talk to that country, that's also a big nope. Now let's pretend that on this Earth thing, Becky wants to go to this other nation and do ham radio stuff over there. If there is an agreement and you get permission, then congratulations, you can operate ham radio from that country. In fact, while you're on the boat on the way to that country, you can operate your ham radio license in international waters. In that circumstance, U.S. laws and the laws of where the boat comes from apply. In our hypothetical situation, Becky is maritime mobile when she's on the boat and identifies as KG7FZH slash SQ, a mouthful if I've ever heard one, while she's in our hypothetical nation. Rules always make something sound more complex than it really is, so while you're jamming all this stuff into your head, remember one thing. DXing is fun. Be sure to give it a try in the HF shack when we're hanging out. Now we need to talk about call signs. You've probably seen a number of call signs already. Call signs are basically the name of a station. They are unique across the world. Here are some example call signs. Becky's call sign, my own call sign, and the call sign of the Radio Club of Tacoma. These are all US calls, and let's discuss what they actually mean. Each call sign has a prefix. US prefixes begin with K, N, W, and the range AA through AL. They are one or two characters long. Each US call sign has a single number, 0 through 9. The number corresponds to the region where the licensee lived when they got their license. The numbers also correspond to this map. Here, let me get you a clearer version. Got it? Cool, you can download this one online. Anyway, the suffix is made up of one through three letters, and this is the part that makes the call sign unique. 
In Becky's case, her prefix is KG, her zone number is 7, and her postfix is FZH. The KG is a US prefix, the 7 is from the gargantuan zone 7, and the FZH is the unique part assigned by the FCC. In my case, my call sign begins with N, and since I'm originally from the Chicago area, my zone number is 9, and my postfix is MII. Not a particularly good call sign for Morse code. In the Radio Club of Tacoma's case, W is a US prefix, 7 from the same enormous zone as Becky, and DK from the FCC, though W7DK's case is interesting. The Radio Club has been around 107 years, and in the early years, they didn't bother with a prefix locally. Originally, the club used 7DK until 1928, where prefixes were required. This is not on the test, it's just interesting. You'll notice that Whiskey 7 Delta Kilo isn't assigned to a person, but to a club. This is the one time where someone may hold more than one call sign. A club requires a trustee who is amateur radio licensed and must have at least four members. We're not going to get into it here, but the FCC hands out different types of call signs depending on the class of the license holder. That's not universal, as both Becky and I have our technician call signs, but we also hold more advanced licenses. If you're curious, you can check chapter seven of the book, where it also covers vanity call signs, which are call signs that you could pick. And that's it for this video, which corresponds to most of chapter seven in the ARRL book that you received. Oh, I know it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot. It's rote memorization. It's the hardest stuff to do. It's a lot of disconnected stuff here, but it corresponds to 20% of your grade. They want to make sure you've got this stuff down. So you'll probably want to watch this a couple, three times as you go through the series, and maybe even while you're with us on the weekend. It should be no surprise to you that I'm going to mention that we've got test exams at imnotsquitting.com slash exam. Go take one if you haven't. If you've been keeping up and following along, you should be near passing at this point. See you next time for our last episode.